Houston, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready for the event. Spokesman review, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Kip Hill with the Spokesman Review. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear, Kip. How do you hear me? I hear you just fine. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, this is new for me, <laughs> and it's it's really cool. It's a pleasure to talk to you, too, especially to be talking to my home state of Washington and especially to eastern Washington. Oh, yeah, we're, we're really snowy over here today. I, I don't know if you could tell that up there. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, the last time we talked and the last time you talked to the governor was before the holiday. I'm just kind of curious what it's like celebrating the holidays up there on the station. You know, we actually had a pretty fantastic time up here. We definitely missed being home with our families, but we're a bit of a family up here ourselves. We call, our, call it our space family. So we had some awesome meals together, exchanged some gifts, uh, even had a cookie decorating contest. So there was a lot of holiday cheer to go around, and it was just a fantastic time uh, for our crew to bond and have a special set of holidays together. That's great. Now, when you do New Year's, obviously you're floating around. Do you get to pick which time zone you celebrate the New Year, or how do you do that? You know, we celebrated New Year in almost every time zone. We celebrated when we crossed the international dateline on New Year's. We celebrated with each of our ground control centers around the world, and we celebrated on Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, which is what we use up here for our schedules. So it was a pretty festive New Year. We rung it in several times. That's great. That's great. Well, we were watching here in, in Washington when you first came through that hatch, and you were the first through the hatch in your, in your expedition up there. I, I'm wondering if you could take me back to that moment. I know you've been up there a while. What was that like for you? It was an absolutely fantastic moment and really a fulfillment of a dream. You know, we've been training so much to get up here and we have some awesome training facilities at NASA, even a scale mock-up of the space station that looks almost exactly like the real space station. So it was pretty surreal to be floating through the hatch and kind of recognizing it from our training, but realizing how different it was to actually being in microgravity. And it was real special to give Mark Van de Hei a big hug. We've really been looking forward to uh, getting up here to join him for Expedition 66, seeing Anton and Piotr again. Um, so it was just really, really special and almost unbelievable that we had actually made it. Kind of describe a, a, a typical day for you. I know you're doing a lot of experiments. What is it like waking up and, and what's your work day like? You know, a typical day up here, we all normally get up around 6, 6.30, have breakfast, and start reviewing the schedule and the plan for the day. At about 7.30, we have a planning conference with all of the control centers around the world and just make sure everybody's on the same page with what we're hoping to get done. And then we get to work. We usually work from that planning conference in the morning till about 7, 7.30 at night with breaks for lunch and also to work out to maintain our fitness and our bone density and stay healthy up here. But in between, we're doing everything we need to do to keep the space station running maintenance both corrective because something broke and also preventative to keep our systems healthy but like you mentioned we're executing a ton of science experiments we're doing over 350 experiments during our six-month mission up here and right now it's kind of like science season we have a cargo dragon here that brought us a bunch of really exciting experiments so we've been really busy setting those up executing them and getting data back to the ground I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you're aware, one, one of those experiments I think that came up in the December 21st um, launch, um, we heard we, the spokesman review for viewers, you know, we, we cover both Washington and Idaho. I understand there's actually some science up there from the University of Idaho dealing with um, polymers and, and bacterial growth. Is that something you've seen? Are you aware of that? Uh, is that part of your work? 
I've seen a lot of experiments from a lot of different universities, but I actually installed a uh, NanoRacks payload into one of the NanoRacks experiment laboratories, um, kind of these miniature laboratory modules that had a University of Idaho sticker on it. And my sister is actually a University of Idaho grad, Stephanie. Uh, so I had that, you know, go vandals thought in my head as I was putting it in. Pretty cool to see. <laughs> They'll be happy to hear that, I'm sure. Um, kind of, you know, you you worked in submarines. I'm sure you've gotten this question before, but now having been up there since November, kind of compare the work on a submarine to the work that you're doing on the space station. Is it similar? Is it different? In what ways? It's similar in so many ways, and I feel like I'm discovering new similarities every single day. The equipment we operate up here is really similar because we need all of the same things to keep us alive. You know, human beings aren't supposed to be living and working under the surface of the ocean or in the vacuum of space. So we need things to maintain a safe atmosphere, to deal with human waste, to have all the resources we need to work here and actually accomplish a mission. Um, and the work's pretty similar too, that we're working with a lot of equipment, a lot of operational uh, procedures, a lot of technical stuff going on, fixing things when they break to keep things running. Uh, there are some differences too though. You know, our crew is really small compared to my submarine crew of 165 people. So there's only a few of us up here. So we're really reliant on all of the expertise on the ground. We're really just kind of the eyes and ears and hands up here, but we're not really experts in anything that we're doing because there's just too many things going on with all of these experiments, all of this equipment. The true experts are in mission control in Houston or in Huntsville for our scientific experiments or around the world with our international partners. So it's a little bit different that the, the big crew is back on Earth and we're just here kind of representing presenting them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to ask, you know, going back to that time when you first got on the station, um, you know, there was this, there were new, there was news that, you know, uh, there was, a, there was a missile test and there was some debris out there. I'm curious how much you knew of what was going on and how much that affected your operations and the work that you were doing right when you got onto the station. Yeah, that was a couple days after our arrival, and we heard about it right away from Mission Control. Uh, the team on the ground made some really sound, conservative decisions, doing everything they could to keep us as safe as possible, which included safe havening in our launch vehicle. So uh, my crew, Crew 3, was in our cargo dra or crew dragon um, for a few hours just while they got a better understanding of the situation, where the debris field was, and what kind of risk it was posing. Um, now the the debris field is pretty dispersed, so we're just kind of living with a heightened risk of a strike to the space station. It's about two times higher than it was before, but we control it to a really tight level anyway. Um, if there's ever a greater than one in 100,000 chance that something could hit us, we actually move the space station to stay out of the way of space debris. Um, so it's kind of a new normal now for us, but we have fantastic support on the ground to really understand what those risks are and do everything we need to to manage them. So from our perspective, we just executed the procedures that ground directed us to. Um, and in a way, it was actually a really interesting opportunity for our crew to respond to a real contingency in coordination with the ground when we first got up here. And we learned a lot from that experience that we've carried forward throughout the increment. Great, great. Um, is there, this is sort of a journalist question, but you mentioned all of the preparation that you did to get out there. I know that we, we talked before you left about all the preparation you did. Is there anything about space travel and, and being on the station that, that really surprises you that you weren't expecting? You know, there's a million little things that you hear about from the experienced astronauts that you think you're prepared for until you experience them yourself, and then it's just a little bit different. You know, you can understand intellectually what microgravity will be like. The fact that if I let go of this microphone, it'll stay floating here, but if I stop paying attention, it has some rate and velocity on it, and it's probably gonna disappear. I may never see it again. Um, I would say the one thing that I truly wasn't expecting and hadn't considered even a little bit is I have curly hair up here. On the ground, my hair is straight, and something about being in microgravity, not having it <laughs> weighted down, I have curly hair. That, that really surprised me and my entire family. My sisters were like, what is going on with your hair? I was like, I don't know. I guess this is what my space hair looks like. <laughs> they don't make, uh, you know, 
materials up there to hold it down. I don't even know if you could at that point. <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of going with it. I've wanted curly hair my whole life, so I figured this six months is my chance. There you go. There you go. You talked about your family. Uh, how much do you get to talk to people on the ground who aren't reporters, your family and folks like that? When do you get an opportunity to do that? Uh, we have really fantastic resources up here, especially, you know, compared to my time on the submarine where we had occasional very slow email and no other way to communicate with family. And then also being a wife of a former army officer, having him deployed and kind of not, you know, being different communication strategies with him, but never real time. Um, it's pretty special up here to be able to actually call the ground. We have an internet protocol phone, so as long as we have good satellite coverage, we can call home. And once a week, we get to do video chats with our families. Um, so I've, I've gotten to video chat with my family on the holidays. Uh, my niece was opening Christmas presents for me. She was my surrogate present opener on Christmas back home. So uh, we get to stay really connected, and that's super special for us to get to have them in our lives and share our experience up here with them. So your niece opened your gifts. Is there anything you're looking forward to getting back to uh, gift-wise when you when you get back uh, from the space station? Yeah, I'll say my family did a pretty good job this year, and I put the present buying all in the hands of my husband, Tom, and I can say he did a good job. We got good reviews from the family on the presents he picked out. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, can you kind of describe the area of the space station that you're in right now for those that are watching it? What, what are we looking at here behind you and everything? Yeah, I'm actually here in the Japanese experimental module Kibo. Um, it's one of our laboratory modules aboard the space station. So here we conduct some of the most advanced science experiments that we're doing on the space station. Um, and behind me, actually, the circular door here is an airlock, not for people, but for equipment and experiments. So outside, uh, there's actually a robotic arm that can remove experiments from um, things that we, from the pallet that we can send in and out, and then we can bring them back in. Um, so it allows us to increase the number of experiments that we can actually do externally on the space station without having to rely on humans going outside for a spacewalk to deliver that equipment. Um, so we do a lot of work in here. I work in here almost every day, and it's also a great great spot to talk to people on the ground because there's lots of exciting stuff going on. Awesome. Awesome. Well, do you have, you mentioned at the beginning, Eastern Washington, you know, I, I know you talked about, you know, vacationing up here with family and stuff. Do you have a message for folks um, in this part of the country of, of what you're doing, what, what you'd like to tell them right now? Yeah, I think about home all the time. Every time we get a pass over the Northwest, I'm always trying to look out the window, whether it's day or night. Uh, lately, it, at night, we've been catching some awesome auroras over the Pacific Northwest and over Canada. Um, and it's just been really cool to look down and reflect on the place that made me who I am. You know, I think the fantastic teachers, coaches, mentors, community that brought me up is what enabled me to chase my dreams throughout my life and have the awesome opportunity to serve my country as, as a member of the Navy, the submarine force, and now as an NASA astronaut. And so I'm just really grateful for all of those people who supported me along the way and continue to support me now while I'm up here. Great. And you're scheduled to be back in, in April. Do I have that right on the schedule? Yes, we should be returning uh, in late April after SpaceX Crew 4 joins us up here for about a week of direct handover. Awesome, awesome. Well, I think that uh, exhausts the questions that I have for you. Um, was there anything you wanted additionally to let people know about what's going on up there, give them a glimpse of, of your work day and, and how things are going? No, I really appreciate all your thoughtful questions and for you continuing following my mission. I actually, uh, we talked to Anne McLean, I think on Christmas Eve, she was on one of our conferences um, because she's working in the ISS program office now. Um, and she was actually in Spokane and it was really cool to see all the snow out her window. She was at her mom's house. Um, so it was just really special to have those connections with our colleagues here. And we're always thinking about Washington. 
Well, we're always thinking about you, and it's uh, yeah, that snow is still around. I can confirm that for you. I think we're supposed to get some more. So, uh, uh, thanks so much for talking to me. It's been a pleasure and an honor, and uh, good luck out there. Thank you. I'm sure I'll talk to you again in the future, Kip. I look forward to it. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all the participants from Spokesman Review. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. <laughs>